Who remembers where we are and what we're talking about? It's on your notes. Um, we are talking about the predicated I am's, and we are talking about the first of these, and we're taking two weeks because it's a big one. Um, why do they call it a big one, Evangeline? Evangeline? I said this is a big one. Why is it a big one? Because it's big. Um, <laughs> that's why they call it a big one. Um, so uh, we're going to recap a little bit and then get more into, uh, into this statement and the, the, the importance of it, the effects of it, the implications of it, if you will. Um, have you guys ever had, <laughs> ever had somebody say something to you that you thought, I couldn't have possibly heard that right. I'm going to need you to say that again because I don't understand it. Uh, I was thinking about this, uh, and this is a long time ago. I think I was probably, I don't know, maybe in grad school. And I was going to try on a pair of pants at a store. It was like a big store. I think it was a Kmart of all places. And I, uh, I, I go to like get help at, because they had keep the, 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 the rooms locked. And I there's a button to push. I finally push a button. Somebody comes over and helps me. And she says, as she unlocks it, and I'm walking in, she's like, be careful when you close the door because it might lock you in and I'm about to go on my break. And she just left. And it was this moment where I said, I, I can't have possibly just heard what, what you said. Um, I don't understand why you would tell me that. I don't understand what I'm supposed to do about that. Uh, clearly, there's a miscommunication here. Uh, Jesus runs into a similar moment, only that was because the person who was talking to me was saying something that did not make any sense and, and wasn't right. Sometimes the breakdown is on the speaker's end. Sometimes the breakdown is on the hearer's end. Uh, we're going to talk through some breakdowns that happened on the hearer's end with this lesson that Jesus taught about being the bread of life. Um, but if you remember, Jesus feeds the, the multitudes, right? He, he feeds these 5,000 men plus women and children, um, and then the people perceive that he is, or at least believe that he is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus sees this and sees that they're going to seize him and make him king, which is, a, that's just kind of a passing comment there. But it's an insight into the people's mindset. Uh, we didn't talk about this last time, but if you are under oppression from a foreign government and you want to have a revolution... A king who can make magic bread and feed your entire nation is valuable, right? Um, because with all, all the armaments and everything, so much of these empires, when they would rule these huge swaths of land, was about provisioning for the people, keeping the people fed. You keep people fed, they'll be happy. They won't, or at least feed them enough so they won't revolt, but not so much they can revolt, um, and so they're like, hey, if we have our own food source here, this is great. We can do our own thing here. So they, Jesus sees that these people are thinking down this materialistic mindset, right? Um, they're perceiving him as a prophet. They want him to be king. And Jesus bolts. He leaves. Like, this is not the time for this. The next day, they chase him down. And they begin to compare him to Moses. Remember this? They say, all right, Moses gave us bread for like the entire time we're in the wilderness. What are you going to do to prove that you are even greater, that you are the next great prophet? And Jesus realizes, like, and I realize maybe this is the right word because Jesus knows. He notices and perceives that these people aren't comparing him to the right thing. Uh, they are comparing him to a person, to Moses. And Jesus wants to take this opportunity to show that he is not to be compared to the prophet. He is to be compared to the provision. He is the bread of life. And so Jesus declares that he is the bread of life, um, that the foreshadowing in the wilderness of this miraculous provision was not because of a, it's not foreshadowing another great man, but it's foreshadowing an eternal source of provision and sustenance. So that's where we are. Uh, we're going to look a little bit into the meaning of I am the bread of life, and then we're going to talk about the implications of it. Uh, the first question, and if you ask this, uh, especially as the, as the passage goes on and gets, Jesus gets more kind of explicit with the eating and drinking terminology, the first question is that probably threw off a lot of these people is, is Jesus endorsing cannibalism here? I think it's a fair question, right? 
It's one thing when he says, I'm the bread of life. You're like, okay, okay, I'm tracking with you metaphorically here, maybe. And he says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink my blood. Jesus like dials up the intensity of the metaphor here. And the question is, is he endorsing this? And I feel like it, we should at least address this because uh, you very well might have uh, conversations with people who are, uh, who are not Christians, who are, who are maybe from an atheist perspective, who will bring this up as a charge against Jesus. Uh, first of all, uh, I think it's clear that he's not because Jesus never actually dismembers himself and feeds his disciples. That sounds like a really obvious point. But if he says, you will only be saved if you eat of my flesh and nobody eats of, my, of his flesh, then he's a complete failure and we shouldn't be talking about him, right? Uh, that seems really obvious, I know, but Jesus never did this. And then when he, deci- he died, his disciples never tried to eat him, okay? So it's... <laughs> It feels stupid having to say this. Um, I'm a parent. I'm a dad. So sometimes you're used to saying the things you feel like you shouldn't need to say out loud. Um, (laughs) Jesus is not endorsing cannibalism here. Now, another thing that we have to talk about, though, applies more here locally, uh, is the concept of what we would call transubstantiation. Who's Who's heard that word? Transubstantiation. So transubstantiation... um, the doctrine of, the, of transubstantiation would be the doctrine that when, uh, when the Lord's Supper, specifically the Eucharist, is, is performed, that there is a miraculous transformation of the elements of the bread and of the cup to become the literal embodiment of the flesh and blood of Jesus. Um, and we don't hold to that position here, okay? We do not hold to that uh, there are churches, uh, there is a, a major denomination that does hold to that. We do not hold to that. But I think what's interesting, though, is that we can use that, that illustration when Jesus, Jesus... So Jesus in John 6 says, I am the bread of life. So he's taking I am, taking himself as the object and comparing it to the bread. When we fast forward to any of the, uh, the, the recordings of the Lord's Supper... The one I have here is in Luke 22. Jesus says, is then looking at the bread and says, this is my body. So you see the two-way uh, metaphorical language here. He's going from, in one direction from himself to the bread and then from the bread to himself. Um, and I think what we can tell there is that, that clearly, again, this is not cannibalism. This is a metaphorical language that Jesus is using here. We can look better at what he means when we look at a couple of the verses, uh, John 6, 47, uh, where he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. And then John 6, 54 says, Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood, this is where people think it gets a little weird, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So what you see here is a deepening of the metaphor. He's taken a metaphorical idea and he's starting to push on the edges of it. You know, sometimes you push a metaphor too far and it breaks. Jesus isn't breaking this, but he's just pushing it to the edges. He's, let's expand what this means. Let's assign other other attributes of this metaphor to specific actions. So if I'm the bread, then what he's saying here, then... To eat that bread effectively is to believe in me. It's like, you know, Frank's classic, get in the wheelbarrow from Alpha, right? It's, it's a metaphorical explanation of the act of believing in Christ. Um, this, uh, I, I, I thought this, this uh, explanation by D.A. Carson in his commentary was really helpful. He says, the essentially symbolic nature of bread of life and related expressions in this discourse is disclosed by the mingling of metaphorical and non-metaphorical elements. Jesus is the bread of life, but it is the person who comes to him who does not hunger, not the person who eats him. Similarly, it is the person who believes in him who does not thirst, not the person who drinks him. Thus, when the language becomes more rigorously metaphorical in verses 49 and following, we re- and we read of G- eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood, the meaning of the metaphors has already been established. This is why we've talked about don't read a Bible verse. Okay, don't just be like, I'm going to plop right here in John 6, 54, and be like, all right, 
in order to have eternal life, I need to eat Jesus. Well, no, you've missed, you missed the first 53 verses of this, of this passage where he does the miracle, he feeds the people, and then ties it into himself as the bread who sustains them forever. We can't just jump in like in the middle of a movie and expect to understand everything that's going on. Uh, so what Jesus is doing here, he's saying, you've experienced temporary provision. I am your eternal provision. Um, it's similar to the sacrificial system, right? You had, every time these sacrifices were made, you had temporary, you had provisional forgiveness of sins. I give myself for eternal forgiveness of sins. It's the same idea here. To partake in Christ's body and blood is to trust in his saving work, in his atoning sacrifice, as the only means of eternal salvation. It's the only way we can live forever. <laughs> and I want to notice also, just as in the Old Testament, the bread was given and not earned. It was collected, but it wasn't made. It, the people didn't earn it. In the same way, what, what Jesus is saying here is that's, that is symbolic of the fact that I'm giving this eternal life. It's going to cost me everything like we talked about last week. Um, but it costs you nothing but believing and consuming. Now, I do think it's interesting to ask, if we understand this imagery, why Jesus chose this particular imagery in this circumstance. Uh, and I don't know that I put this, this kind of thought in your notes. It was kind of a last minute thought for me. Um, there's a lot of things, or at least a, a few things, that we need to survive every day. Um, and you can, you know, there's things like human interaction. There's, but real basic level, we need food, we need drink, we need air, right? You get those three things, you'll get going for a while. Um, I think it's, it's helpful to ask, why did Jesus choose the food analogy in this one? Um, remember, we talked about his interaction with the woman the Samaritan woman at the well, and he was about this close. He effectively said, I'm the living water. So he's used other imagery before. The question of why he uses bread here is, is interesting. And I think we can, remember, we, so we talked about this. Jesus, God created a universe with elements in it for us to point to and to understand him and understand his works and understand his character. So that is true. And I, I made a point that God created this universe and it, it wasn't like Jesus happened to notice these things and it was a lucky coincidence. It was that God put those things there to be noticed. At the same time, I don't want to take away, Jesus was much more, who believes Jesus was a great teacher? Who believes Jesus was a great teacher? Yeah, he was a great teacher. <laughs> um, he was more but Jesus was a great teacher. And so Jesus here is reading the room. He's got a crowd of hungry people. And I think the most obvious explanation for why Jesus talks about bread here is because the people are hungry. Um, he could have talked about water. He could have talked about air. He could have talked about light. He, he uses, he, this is the first of seven I am statements. But the one he uses here is because the people are hungry. And Jesus is a wise teacher who knows to connect with the point, the felt physical need in his, in his listeners' situations and tie it to an eternal spiritual need, okay? Um, this is good, by the way, any of you who do any kind of teaching, whether it is, you know, teaching in a setting like this or in LCC Kids or parenting or counseling or whatever you may do, sometimes we can draw on analogies or metaphors or imagery that only we understand because it makes the most sense to us, maybe some obscure book, something that we've read or whatever it is, or whatever we're feeling going on in our life right then, that is never going to be as effective as drawing on connections in the lives of the people that we're talking to, right? That's just never going to have the same purchase with them, never the footing with them. Um, I'm reminded of, and I'm going to do the same thing here, by the way, just, you know, I'm going to reference a movie that many of you may not have seen. So if you don't understand this, then I'm just making the point of how important it is for your audience to understand what you're talking about. But if you do understand this, then I'm making the point about how important it is for your audience to understand what you're talking about. In the movie, The, Cla uh, the movie Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a, 
the dad loves his son. He's a good dad. But all he knows about is fishing. And so he uses fishing metaphors all the time to talk to his son, who doesn't know anything about fishing. And that, the kid's like, I don't understand fishing metaphors. Um, that's bad teaching because he doesn't give a connection point that his audience hears and understands. Jesus sees the point that his audience is hungry, and I'm going to tie this to something to help them understand something about me and what God is doing through my mission here. Um, so I don't, think, uh, I don't think Jesus could have not talked about anything else, but here the point is I want to talk about the bread of life because you're hungry. One last thing to talk about before we get into the implications here is, is Jesus establishing the Lord's Supper here? We talked about Luke 22. We talked about, about the Lord's Supper. There are, there's debate amongst people way smarter than me about whether this is the institution of the Lord's Supper. I don't know. What I do know is that by the time we get to the Lord's Supper, Jesus is pointing to this metaphor again. He's saying, this is important. Remember that one. There's six other metaphors we're going to talk about. None of those get mentioned there. None of those get turned into sacraments. This is the one that Jesus says, hey, this is a big deal, okay? So uh, that's a unique quality amongst these I am statements. Um, so I think that's a good idea of what Jesus is saying and doing here and what he's not saying and doing. I want to get to the implications or the effects of Jesus as our bread of life. The first one is obvious. It's eternal life. So if Jesus is the bread of life and we partake in this bread of life, then we have life. Um, which is something that, again, as, as if you've been in the church for a long time, is easy to take for granted. But, you know, this is like the old Romans road, the first like five verses you learned back in, you know, in the day. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, we had a problem. We were mired in death, in our sin and the death that accompanied it. And we were without God and without hope in this world. But God intervened and sacrificed himself and gave us eternal life. And the fact that I can say that right now without being overwhelmed and dropping in worship is probably a sign that, <laughs> that my heart is not as sensitive as it should be because it really is the most miraculous thing. It's such a mind-blowing concept that maybe we just, our brain kind of has learned to just get used to it because the first time you really experience it is overwhelming. Um, and it, I would hope that it becomes freshly overwhelming over and over again to us, that we should die, but we live. And that is because we have the bread of life in Jesus. You know, Jesus talks about the, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died, right? I've come to give you life eternal. He who eats of this bread and drinks this, of this cup will never die. Um, I think it's interesting also, by the way, if we want to look at that manna in the wilderness, even in, in so in Joshua, once they, they are, uh, once they get to the promised land, I thought this was really fascinating. And Joshua 5, 12 says, And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Um, what I love about that is that not only is Jesus' eternal provision foreshadowed in the manna, and that I will provide for you, even as they enter the promised land, there's a different angle of the foreshadowing of, oh, I'm going to provide once and for all for you. I'm going to provide once and for all. You, in, instead of this, the manna, the manna stops the day they get into the promised land. And then there's a new kind of provision. By the way, also, vineyards they didn't plant, right? Cisterns they didn't dig, right? This is a different kind of the Lord's provision. Uh, I love that. I thought that, that was just so interesting to me. The complexity that, that God... I've said this before. This sounds really obvious. The Bible is just so well written. It is such a fantastic storyline. Uh, it is all true. 
Uh, but it is such a beautiful narrative from start to finish if you, if you understand the big picture of the Bible. And little things like this about the, the temporary provision turning into a fuller provision sing when you get the full storyline. Eternal life is a big deal here. It's a big deal to John, right? This is, why does John write to his people? What's the number one agenda that John has when he's writing, whether, whether it's his gospel or his epistles? He says, remember, Jesus did lots of things. We have a snippet of them in the book of John. But he says, he says yeah, Jesus did all kinds of other stuff that are not write, written here. Why did I write these things? John 20, 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Believing, consuming, eternal life. That is the big deal here, obviously. 1 John 5, 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you, ha so that you may know that you have eternal life. There is no bigger uh, point of emphasis for John in writing his gospel than his people, his readers, knowing the means to eternal life and knowing that they may believe and have it. Uh, and even at the end of this, so remember, Jesus says this really challenging statement, and a bunch of his followers say, this is a very hard teaching. This is hard. Who can hear it? And he loses a lot of followers. Loses is probably not the right word there. A bunch of, of call them uh, potential followers, leave. They say, this is hard. I can't get this. That's when Jesus looks at, at the remaining disciples and says, you guys going to go too? And I love what Peter says here. It's, it's so, so clear. And we often only read the first verse of this and don't pay attention to the second verse, but I've got them both here. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So Jesus, I mean, Peter here even sees the connection between believing in the person of Jesus and eternal life. And I'm going to bring this other element in that we're going to talk about a little bit more in a second. And the word of God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, right? So Jesus is the manifestation of the word of God. So if you could take these three ideas and bundle them all together, the word of God, the bread of life, Jesus Christ, okay? They are equivalents. So as we're reading, sometimes we have to plug in or understand the other things baked in with that word when we read one of those three. Does that make sense? Did I say that okay? Because it was confusing as it was coming out. When we read bread of life or word of God or Jesus, we should know that we can kind of move those things around because they are equivalent. So I feel silly like kind of just glossing over this, but it is, it, it, the big deal here is that we were dead and can be made alive through the sacrificial work of Jesus purchased by his blood and his flesh on the cross. That's amazing. As amazing is our second point, which is union with Christ. And I talked about this a bunch when we were talking through 1 John, so this is going to be like an inch deep, given the timing that I have. So we don't have the time to go in, but uh, I can look up which week that was and let you guys know, and we can, you can go back and, and read or listen to that one again. Union with Christ, the idea that there is a fundamental connection, uh, intertwining of the believer and Jesus. Uh, in verse 56, Jesus says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And remember, abide is one of John's favorite words. It's the Greek word meno. Uh, it is an active staying still, if that makes sense. I think what I have in your notes is, this is a word meaning to stay, but the implication is one of activity. 
It is not simply to wait around. It is to actively stand as though against either active opposition or natural entropy that could cause one to otherwise fall. It's, it's the standing, <laughs> standing aggressively on, you know, on a hill. It is almost, almost like walking on an escalator in place, right? There's an active, attentive staying in the same spot, a vigilance. Uh, it's the army when the other army is charging. Hold, right? That is the abiding, okay? Um, and, and in this verse and throughout Scripture, this abiding is, is framed in two directions. The first is that we abide in Christ. Uh, and again, this is where we talk about God's Word. Jesus Christ is the physical manifestation of the Word of God. And so we abide in Christ as we abide in God's word. And we abide in God's word both by observing it and observing it, both by seeing or hearing and by doing. Um, let's not be hearers of the word only, but doers also. And lest we think that this is an unfair thing to place upon us, uh, Jesus himself in John 15 says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So that's kind of a crazy thought to me, that there is, despite the fact that, that the Father and the Son are co-members of the Trinity, there is an indication here in Scripture that there's some sort of correlation between Jesus keeping the Father's commandments and abiding in his love. Um, I don't know that I've had time in the last week to fully process that thought. So I'm just going to ask you to put a pin in that and maybe I'll think about it next time I teach. I'll have more ideas about it. But that is crazy to me. Uh, not that I don't believe it, but it's mind blowing to me that there is a, that part of Jesus's abiding in the Father's love is not only manifested by but it sounds, because the conditionality that's in this phrase, uh, dependent upon his keeping his father's commandments. Um, that blows my mind. On the other hand, Christ abides in us. So if the idea of keeping God's commandments sounds challenging, and it is, it is important to remember that we are empowered by the abiding of Christ in us and by the anointing of his Holy Spirit. So remember the, that the resurrected Christ who, who overcame every temptation, who overcame death itself, abides in every person who believes in him. And we are anointed with the same anointing with which he was anointed. When, you know, when John says, when, uh, I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. That's the abiding, okay? And then John says later, Jesus talking, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments and I will ask the father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He's the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him, but you do know him because he remains with you. That abides and will be in you. Um, this has probably become less of a thing lately because of uh, phone batteries are getting better and stuff. But they used to make these phone cases that would also be a battery. Do you all remember these things? It's like a cell phone case. So you put your phone in there, but it would have a battery that would kind of plug into your phone as well. So it was doing two things at the same time. It was protecting your phone and it was powering your phone. Anybody remember these? Am I the only person that remembers seeing this kind of thing? Okay, this is the mutual abiding. Our abiding in Christ protects us, it assures us, it comforts us. Christ abiding in us empowers us to obey his word. This is the mutuality of the abiding. Remember, we talked a lot in 1 John about this kind of circular nature. Not everything is neat and straight and linear sometimes. There's a, there's a wovenness and a complexity to the abiding of Christ in us and our abiding in Christ um, it's just beautiful to me. 
Um, there's so much more on that. Like I said, we can, we can go, uh, you can go listen to that. Uh, if you want more, there's a great book uh, called Union with Christ that I would recommend as well on that topic. Um, the third thing, the third implication is delighting in Christ. Um, I don't want to overlook this because I think it's easy to like see this as some kind of kind of throwaway thing. I, again, there's lots of foods that we eat. Jesus picked bread. There were even fish there. He didn't say I'm the fish. Jesus said I'm the bread of life. I don't know if y'all know this, but bread is delicious. <laughs> It's universal. Every culture has its own bread. Everybody does this thing. They're all different. They're all wonderful. You got, you know, sourdough, you've got naan, you've got tortillas, you've got um, wontons, uh, you've got ciabatta, uh, soda bread, Irish soda bread. Um, there's, bread is great. Beignets, right? There's, bread is a wonderful thing. Um, I've never met anybody who like crashed their New Year's resolution because they couldn't say no to the green beans. It's like, no, I just couldn't stay away from bread. Like that's bread. And again, God didn't have to make food taste good. He made food delightful. He made bread delightful. And he says, I'm like that. Um, Isaiah 55 is a verse that is often, as commentators look at this passage, they compare these two verses and 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 correlate them. Um, in Isaiah 55, 1 and 2, it says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? By the way, that's that typical Hebrew, um, what's, uh, I can't think of the word. Uh, parallelism. So he's saying, basically equating things that are not bread with things that do not satisfy. Um, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Isaiah outlines three things about this food. It's free to all who would receive it. It's satisfying and it's delightful. Isaiah's and, and Christ's argument here is stop working for substandard provisions, for things that are not going to satisfy and that are going to pass away. Trust in God for provision that will delight and satisfy you forever. Come, taste. I, this is what, I think this is one of the most beautiful passages in the Old Testament for sure. Just the beauty of God saying, come, eat, delight. Let us fellowship together and, and delight in the goodness of my provision for you. Um, you know, I was thinking about this. There's still going to be bread in heaven. The whole point of bread isn't just to get us there. Like there's still going to be goodness and bread to just delight in in heaven. Um, more so, there's still going to be goodness in Christ to delight in for eternity. Our, our eternal life is secured, but there is the beauty of the person and work of Jesus. Um, just a wonderful, the God-man, right? That we get to delight in fellowship with for eternity. Uh, let's not overlook, let's not be too academic. Let's, let's enjoy who Jesus is. Uh, lastly, um, the communion with the saints. Uh, there's so much, by the way. There's so many more implications. I just did four. Um, Y'all know the word companion literally means one who breaks bread with another. Come with panis, bread. Your companions are the people with whom you break bread they're the people with whom you share meals. And this is certainly true, first and foremost, in a spiritual sense. Um, 
this passage in 1 Corinthians 10, 17. Because there is one bread. Who's the bread? Jesus. That's a Sunday school answer, guys. Y'all got that. Uh, we're in, yeah. Because there's one bread, we who are many are one body because we, sorry, for we all partake of the one bread. There is a unity in us. I thought about asking Charlie to just bake me the biggest loaf of bread she could bake me. I just didn't want to place that on you guys. Uh, Charlie Mesh makes bakes incredible bread, and she's also baked like enormous breads. And I just didn't know if the logistics would work. But um, because we all partake of that one bread, first and foremost, let's start here, the figurative meal. Because we partake of Jesus, we are all one body. We are one body together who has shared in this eternally satisfying meal. There is a unity that I have with you in this room if you are a believer, even if I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet, that is different than the union that I have with a family member who doesn't know Jesus. We are related in a different way, and we are companions in a unique sense that is provided for by the body of Jesus. We have, and look, don't not companionship. <laughs> um, it is a glorious thing. From the very beginning, it's not good that man should be alone. And obviously Eve is the number one companion that he's, he's pointing to there. But it, we need one another. We need companions. And that, that fellowship is purchased at a cost that is the blood and the body of Jesus. But it didn't just stay there. One of the, I have one of the passages here, but there's a couple. In Acts, one of the defining characteristics of the church when they are first bursting on the scene in the first few chapters of Acts is they eat together a lot. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And this, there's not an indication that this is just them doing the Lord's Supper over and over again. Um, this breaking of bread is a, is, it's a it's colloquialism for they, they shared dinner together. They ate together, apparently a lot, enough that it is a like, noteworthy thing that, that Luke records in the book of Acts. These people, their, their lives were knit together through the sharing of a table. Um, we have this figurative unity companionship, but it is greatly facilitated by practically breaking bread together, okay? Let me ask you this. Raise your hand if you have had somebody in this, house, in this room who is not related to you, you know, familiarly, uh, if you've had any of these people over to dinner at your house. Raise your hand, Okay. All right, put it down. Raise your hand if you have been to dinner at somebody in this house's, in this room's house. Okay, that's better. I want us to work in the next year. I want to ask that question like next year and have every hand go up. Okay. We become a more tightly knit body by breaking bread together. Uh, Am I just saying this because I love food? Kind of. But <laughs> I think it's biblical. I think we see something in the body of, of the church that is strengthened by dining together. Like, I've been in small groups for years. Those are wonderful. Um, but there's something about having one other person or two other people at your house and sitting and talking, and fellowshipping, and sharing, and bringing together. Um, that, is, that is a beautiful component of the family life of the body that God has provided for us. And I want us to lean into that. Uh, I know I can get an amen from Lester. Lester will cook for all y'all. You, you bring a sign-up sheet next week, Lester. We'll just sign up for dinner at Lester's house. Um, Lester can throw down in the kitchen. Um, I want us to work. Can we commit to work on that as a group? Can we commit to know one another better by getting into each other's lives in the mess with the kids and the, just the, the, can we carve out time and energy and provision for one another? 
Can we do that? Because I think that's part of what Jesus bought with his body. And I think that we, I think we miss out if we live our little isolated lives and don't work as true companions. So um, that's all that I have. Before I pray, I want to remind you guys that we're doing something weird today in church. Uh, <laughs> Keith is going to preach first, and then we're going to have worship. So that's at 10 o'clock. So I know what 10 o'clock usually looks like around here. Um, there's lots of people in the lobby. So 10 o'clock, if you want to look back there or up here, that's when the little hand <laughs> is on the X and the big hand straight up and down at the XII, okay? If you have a digital watch, it's when there's a line and then a bunch of circles, okay, with some dots in the middle. That's 10 o'clock. At that moment, you should have your hindquarters in a seat in the sanctuary so you can listen to the teaching of the word, okay? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this group. Lord, I pray that you would uh, unite us, God, more and more. Lord, help us to be true companions to one another. Uh, God, thank you for taking people from various backgrounds and walks of life, Lord, socioeconomic groups, races, previously religions. Thank you for taking a group of people and through your body, uniting us into one body. Uh, Lord, thank you for that miraculous work, Lord, and thank you for that body being able to continue into eternity because, Lord, you have bought eternal life for us at your cost. Thank you, Father, for your provision. Lord, help us to worship you uh, and delight in the goodness of your provision for us. In Jesus' name, amen.